Hi, my name is Alex Casano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we will be having Penny Cook. Penny Cook is a retired lieutenant for the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office and the current historian of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. So I hope you enjoy this presentation and this presentation will be about the history of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Penny Cook. I'm the archive historian from the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. I worked there from 1978 to 2005, about 27 years, retired as a lieutenant. And now for the past 15 years, I've been uh, doing the history of the Sheriff's Office. For the first half of that 15 years, I kind of did it on my own. And then the Sheriff's Office and I got together and I now speak to new recruits about the history of the Sheriff's Office and I'm delighted to be here. I also speak with historical societies too. And we'll get right into this. Um, I'll try to make it short, but I talk a lot, so I'll try to keep it together. Uh, this first slide will show you that in the initial, when, when the Sheriff's Office became the Sheriff's Office in 1912, was the first day that Pinellas County became Pinellas County. Because as most of you know from the Clearwater Historical Society, uh, we were West Hillsborough County before we became Pinellas County on January 1st of 1912. So up until the mid-80s, we were called the Sheriff's Department, and after that, most counties in Florida went to the name Office of the Sheriff uh, to co coincide with the legislator's name in the law, so we became the Sheriff's Office, as most ones in Florida did. We've had 14 sheriffs in 108 years. Um, I'll talk about all the ones through uh, Don Genome. Uh, the rest of them, uh, I have longer presentations, we'll talk about the rest of the sheriffs, but because this is a historical society, I'll just talk about the early sheriffs. Uh, Marvel Whitehurst was the first sheriff appointed in 1912 by the governor. He served a term and a little bit more than a second term. Uh, he was ousted for some shady dealings, which back in the 1900s and 1920s wasn't that rare. So at that time when Marvel was ousted, uh, Lorenzo Sloat was made sheriff and he only served a year. I have no pictures of Lorenzo Sloat, so if anybody comes across a picture of Lorenzo Sloat, please let me know. William Lindsay was the next sheriff. He only served one term from, <coughs> excuse me, he was a St. Pete policeman, uh, and he served one term, like I said. Roy Booth came in in 1925. Now, the Booth family is part of the McMullen Booth Road family. Um, as you all know here, I'm speaking for the choir, but a lot of our roads in Pinellas County are named from these early pioneer families. The Booths, the McMullens, the Coachmans, uh, the Starkeys, the Bryan family who had a dairy on Bryan Dairy Road, the Belchers, uh, they were all pioneer families and a lot of our roads here are named after them. So Roy Booth served two terms and you can see they were broken up because in 1925-29 in there was a ballot dispute on who had one sheriff. And back at that time the population of Pinellas County was about 2,000 or less people. So they took it to court to find out who actually won. Uh, the race and Gladstone Beatty stepped in for the year that they were deciding and then when they decided that Roy Booth did actually win he came back in and finished the term. Um, and then Ernest Cunningham came in. He was also from St. Petersburg. Todd Tucker came in. Uh, he probably was the first one who started progressing the sheriff's office in the modern times. Todd Tucker is most famous for getting rid of what the sheriff's office at that time had called the fee system where your salary, the sheriff's budget, was based on how many people got arrested or how many people you brought in for jury duty or how many process, civil process you served. And Todd Tucker saw the, the intricate wrongness in that and your salary being based on how many people got arrested. So he went to the county commission and says, listen, we need to be funded uh, some other way. And that's when our budget system came in and all those fees now are paid by the uh, taxes. But Todd Tucker got rid of that. Sid Saunders was our, long, was our only sheriff to die in office. He died of the flu. And then Don Janung came in and he was our longest serving sheriff. He served for 17 years. And the following, the rest of the sheriffs, Bill Roberts, Jerry Coleman, Everett Rice, Jim Coates, and Bob Gualteri uh, are the rest of the sheriffs that we've had. That's a picture of Marvel. Uh, that picture was probably taken when he was in the uh, Spanish-American War. You can see he didn't make sheriff here in 1912 until he was 45 years old. Um, uh, when I first started this, I thought we always had the star badges, but that's not true. I've learned a lot in 15 years. We actually had these kind of badges early on, and then we had the other kind of badges in the lower corner. Um, 
Marbles buried up in the uh, Palm Harbor Pioneer Cemetery. And as you can see from these other pictures I'll show you, uh, he was later in life when he became sheriff. And I'm sure all of you people know who these people are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are the seven McMullen brothers who settled here in 1875 during the Civil War time. And you may wonder why the McMullen family and the brothers here are so important to the history of the sheriff's office. And the bottom three on the first row, um, over on the corner, bottom right corner, is Daniel. Next to him is JP, Captain Jim. And next to him is John. Those three McMullen brothers uh, stayed in Pinellas County. The other ones went up to Chiefland or area, or they were down, <coughs> excuse me, in Polk County. Those three men there, probably more than 50 of their uh, descendants were involved in law enforcement in some way, whether it be St. Pete Police Department, the Clearwater Police Department, the County Patrol. Um, some of them became senators, some of them became judges, some of them became state attorneys. Um, so they were very fundamentally involved with law enforcement in Pinellas County. Um, we also have a display out at Heritage Village, and Daniel's house is out there as well as Captain Jim, the McMullen Coachman Cabin, belongs to him. Those two brothers were married to two sisters from another family, the Campbell family. And so the, when the two brothers married two sisters from another family, their kids became double cousins. You get a little Pinellas County history in my talk also. Um, so uh, I'll speak a lot about Carl McMullen today uh, during the time he was here with Don Janung's error. And uh, Daniel was his great grandfather. And then J.R., which I'll talk about, was his grandfather. Oh, excuse me, J.R. was his dad. This was his great-grandfather. As I'm sure you've all seen this picture also before, this is the courthouse uh, with the beginning members of the uh, Board of County Commissioners and the legislators, excuse me, in Pinellas County, and the, the uh, high important people at the time. Um, over there on the far left is Solomon Coachman. Uh, he was the first uh, chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. His grandson, Mike Coachman, worked for us for many years. Um, and over there, one, two, three, fourth from the left, I've seen this picture identified alphabetically, which does nobody any good. Mm -hmm. I've seen it done front row, back row, which is almost as worthless. But not too long ago, I came across a description which described it with what people were wearing about who they were. So based on that, I'm pretty sure that fourth from the left was Marvel Whitehurst. Um, describing him, and he is a little older in that picture, which would, would fit with that narrative. Right there in the front, the very short man in the front is Eli McMullen. He was the first uh, tax collector in Pinellas County. And also in that picture is Dixie Hollins, who was the first school superintendent. Um, and it's three people on the, on the uh, porch, and if Dora's listening to this, hi Dora, <laughs> but she has a picture uh, about the same time where her mom is standing on the porch. As all you know also, uh, they forgot to put in uh, indoor plumbing when that building was built in 1912. And so all the other pictures that you find after that have the front porch enclosed because that's where they ended up going back and putting in the, the indoor plumbing. A couple of things about this courthouse, it was where the, Pres the Peace Presbyterian Church is up here on Fort Harrison. That's where it was built. There was a controversy where the county seat was gonna be, whether it was gonna be in Clearwater or St. Pete. At that time, Saint, it was it was common to have whatever city was most populated in the county to be the county seat. At that time, St. Pete had the more population and they wanted to be the county seat. Clearwater also wanted to be the county seat. So it was decided whoever built the courthouse the fastest could be the county seat. So in, the, in 10 days, for the cost of less than $4,000, this courthouse was made. Uh, it didn't stand up too well over the years, uh, but, and there was a lot of controversy. St. Pete threatened to come up here and burn ours down. The guy who was going to be served civil process to stop the construction went out in the Gulf in a rowboat, so he couldn't be served in the international waters. Um, it was a big controversy. The wood came from down the street here at the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel, which at that time was owned by Henry Plant, and Henry had a son named Morton, which is what the hospital was named after. The county patrol started in 1937. Uh, at that time, cattle and fruit were the main incomes of the county and a lot of people were going and stealing fruit. And the people in Pinellas County were getting very angry. So they went to the Board of County Commissioners and requested that they start a patrol to guard the fruit groves. For the first year, it was called the Fruit Patrol. We had five districts in Pinellas County. There was a commissioner for each district, so they appointed five men to go out and patrol the fruit groves uh, against thievery. Uh, 
In about a year, they decided the crew patrol name really wouldn't hold still, so they named it the county patrol. I've seen it named county patrol, traffic patrol, Pinellas police. It's been named a lot of things, but the county patrol. It was also thought, before I did a lot of the history, that that was at really sheriff's department, but that's not true, because the county patrol was a separate entity. Uh, they were all deputized, uh, but they, didn't, they weren't employees of the sheriff's office, and back then, a lot of that time happened. Probably up until Ernest Cunningham, we only had about 10 members of the sheriff's office. There's a lot of bonded deputies who went and enforced the law, but they weren't employees of the sheriff's office. And back then, prior to had uniforms and prior to having cars, you basically had a badge, a gun, and a bond card uh, with the authority to, to arrest people. So the county patrol, they had two chiefs of their own. They were funded by the county commissioners. And one of the first county patrolmen, this is J.R. J. R. McMullen. He would have been Carl's dad. Uh, J.R., the picture on the left, was when he was a Clearwater police chief in the 20s. Uh, the, other, the other side is when he ran for sheriff, he lost to Ernest Cunningham. And in there it describes the Townsend Club, which at the time was kind of like an early social security, but they wanted, the people got together and wanted to help give money to the elderly, which at that time was, you know, 60 years old was elderly back then. Um, but they, that was the benefit, so it was a real uh, good thing to be part of the Townsend Clubs. This is a picture of JR when he was in the county patrol. Uh, on the left there, I'll show another picture of him here. He spent 30 years on the county patrol after he, he lost the race for sheriff and when he was the Clearwater Police Chief. Those are Sam Brown belts. Uh, you'll see in the picture where there's boots on and jodhpurs, and that's a wool coat on top of a long sleeve jacket uh, and his hat. And uh, I can imagine how hot it was <laughs> in those days. The other side, uh, JR and his wife had 12 children, which also wasn't very unusual back in those days. And <clears throat> his last child, Betty Jean, just passed away a couple years ago, and that was in Betty Jean's archives. She had his, her dad's hat. And this also was a kind of patrol. It wasn't too long ago, but I found about that this picture was probably taken around Bay Pines area, where they had an office, and you could see here it was called the Pinellas County Police. Um, and we've, I've been able to identify through records most of those people there. The one who is the fourth from the left, that's uh, JR. And you can see there the boots that they wore. The lady there was a the secretary. And this is a later picture of the uh, county patrol. There's only one member in that picture still alive, and that's Walt Jakes. He's over there on your far right corner. Uh, Walt probably told me the, taught me the most about the county patrol, along with Carl. And uh, they were the first uniformed cars we had in Pinellas County. And they did traffic, and they did things that the, the uh, Justice of the Peace or the uh, constables wanted, wanted them to get involved in. This was an early uh, billboard, and I put that up there. That's the county kind of patrol people standing underneath it. But that was a working billboard, and every time that they had a fatality or injury or an accident, they went out and changed them manually. Oh, I'm sure in these days they'd be digital, but it would change constantly. But that was a working flashlight that says red light flashes three days after each fatality. You also notice that it's, it's addressed to a mister, because back in those days, women didn't drive that often. If you read about something in the newspaper, all the women that were involved in the incident were, were identified by their husband's first name rather than their own name. Things have changed. Thank you. Um, and it's also done by the Allstate Commission. A very later picture of, of Carl. Carl didn't meet Carl McMullen, who was 82 years old. Um, and unfortunately, I found this picture on eBay prior to his passing away. Uh, he passed away quite a few years ago. But Carl taught me probably 90% of what I know about the county patrol, and the county actually through his family. Um, I had a picture of this. I had an article about this incident and then Carl told me about the incident, and before he passed away, I was able to find a picture of it, so he was very happy. And what happened here was, he went out, and there's Carl there on your right-hand side. He's got a little nick on his forehead. And he went out to a bar fight uh, with a guy who was in from the service, whether he just got out or was on leave, had a little too much wine or whiskey, <laughs> and got into a fight. So Carl was by himself and uh, went out there and, and put one handcuff on the guy for the fighting, and one handcuff was free and he twirled it around and hit Carl on the top of the head and then Carl got the better of him and uh, over on the left hand side is a, is a justice of the peace and behind him is a constable the justice of the peace were elected every four years as were the constables on opposite years 
And most of them were lawyers. They weren't necessarily judges. Uh, but if you made an arrest, you had to appear before the JP within 24 hours. Uh, Carl worked for the sheriff's office on three different times. He worked here in that picture um, in 45, and then he left to become a highway patrolman, and then he came back under Janung's error uh, at his request to start a patrol division. Sid Saunders was our only sheriff to die in office. He died of the flu. Uh, that's a picture of Sid. Again, uh, you know, that was the style of the dress back then, and we didn't have uniforms until the 59 or 60. There are also stills in Pinellas County, which I'll talk about here shortly. Another eBay picture, uh, there's Todd Tucker in the back with his bow tie on, which he's famous for. Next to him there with the Humphrey Bogart look is uh, Sid Saunders. The guy with the hat in the front is a lawyer, and then behind him was a guy wanted for murder. Another eBay picture, because I know who all these people are because the article told me. So uh, th that's really a good benefit. Sid Saunders' family has become friends. And uh, his daughter invited me over one time and had, gave me access to all his books and his uh, scrapbooks. And that's his bond card from 1933. And when new sheriffs come in, uh, it was to Sid and it was signed by Ernest Cunningham. Well, we don't have that many signatures of Cunningham. That's kind of the beginning of where we have our history, written history at. Prior to that, we wouldn't have anything from sheriffs prior to that. Sid Saunders, <coughs> excuse me, uh, like I said, died in office, and it was a real shock when he passed away. Uh, he had a funeral cortege through Central Plaza uh, with all the uniforms, which you'll see here in a minute. Uh, there's Todd Tucker, and he, Todd was the sheriff at the time, but Sid there was his chief deputy over there with the dark hair. And that was an early polygraph machine. They do them on laptops now. That's an early uh, cell phone. That's the Civil Air Patrol there with the, the badge. The guy with the badge on, they were our patrol people. Sid probably thought that was remarkable to have a phone that you could talk on. Imagine what you'd think now. <laughs> that was an early munitions situation. Um, a lot of the sheriffs, and it just doesn't happen in Pinellas County or Florida, it happens a lot of places. Uh, when the sheriffs leave, they kind of designate who they want to take over. In this case, Sid Saunders is there, the second from the left, and he was a sheriff, and when he passed away in office, his chief deputy, uh, Don Janun became sheriff, and he's there, the third there from the left, holding the, the gun upright. So that's how Don Janun became sheriff. Excuse me. There's the uh, evening independent from where Sid Saunders passed away. He was very young, in his 50s, and that's his uh, funeral through Central Plaza. That, there's an FHP car there in the front, and the rest of those are kind of patrol vehicles. That's an early picture from Estelle. There on the left is uh, Bill Roberts, who was a sheriff when I started in, in 78. Next to him is Don Janung, and then uh, Beverage Agent, and then Sid Saunders. There on the bottom, uh, it took a lot of, of um, sugar to make a still, uh, to make whiskey or whatever you're making in your still. It took a great amount of sugar. So our informants back in those days uh, were the grocers, because somebody would come in and say, I need 50 pounds of sugar, and if they weren't a baker, then they would call the sheriff's office and say, listen, I think this guy's got a still out in the woods. So we would set up on him and, and follow him out there because there were no signs saying stills next left. Um, they were illegal, and so you had to follow somebody out there to do those uh, investigations. Uh, another picture of a still with uh, Sid Saunders, and that guy there was a state beverage agent. We're not we're sure why the deputy had a cigarette in his mouth, but there was no explosions, so it must have been an okay thing. Nothing blew up. Another picture of a still back in, in that was up in Safety Harbor. Uh, again, that's Bill Roberts there on the left. And uh, you can see the state beverage agent there again. And on the far right is uh, the Sheriff Cunningham. Or, excuse me, Sheriff Saunders. This picture is from a still in Wheaton Island. Carl also had 11 brothers and sisters. And this picture was given to me by his uh, brother Robert. And he identified almost everybody in that picture for me. Um, but I'll just hit a few highlights there. On the far left is Todd Tucker, who was the sheriff probably at the time. In the center, the tallest man standing there is um, Jack Strickland, and he was the first chief deputy of the sheriff's office, and he was married to McMullen. Over on his left is uh, Finley McMullen. He, he was a volunteer. He didn't actually work for us, but they all hung out together. And there on the end of that line, pointing the gun, uh, was Carl's dad, J.R. And I don't know what the photography was back in those days, but I'm sure it wasn't a Polaroid picture. 
Um, so whether they did it before or after it occurred, uh, but I've given that picture to the non historical society uh, to pass on since it was their area when that occurred. Don Janelli again was our, our longest serving sheriff, 17 years. And I'm sure that most people who work for him would say he was the most loved. Um, the sheriff's office was a lot smaller back then. He knew everybody's wife's name, all their kids' names, uh, was known for giving a $50 bonus at Christmas. Back in those days, $50 was a lot of money. Um, he was just a very kind man. He was very beloved by the public and uh, did a lot for community relations, as you'll see. As you know, some of you will know, in the middle there is Babe Ruth. Before Don Janung became sheriff, he was a Clearwater policeman. Uh, that's Ernest Williams on uh, Williams side. Williams, I think, on the left, and on the right is uh, Don Janung in his Clearwater outfit, uniform. And you'll see there on on Janung's gun belt how old it was, because then the bullets were on your gun belt. Uh, you took them out one at a time, basically. Uh, and and Babe Ruth uh, was down here for a lot of spring training events. In fact, I think some of his uh, descendants still live here. That was the first, uh, there was some issues with the county patrol. The Board of County Commissioners asked the sheriff, asked Sheriff Janung to take over the county patrol. So at the time, the sheriff's office was up here at the, at the uh, Clearwater Jail. The building still stands there, but it's not a jail anymore. It's an office building. But <coughs> That's where the sheriff's office, the sheriff's office and the sheriff's office both were in that building. So when the county commissioners asked us to take over the county patrol, Sheriff Janung had to move the sheriff's office out to the airport where we had more room for the cruisers, et cetera, and more people. So we moved to the airport, Clearwater Airport, and called the APO office, airport office. And while he still had an office here in downtown Clearwater, the operational part of the sheriff's office went out to the airport. We stayed in that airport until 1972. In 1975, when we moved to the corner of Umberton and Seminole, where we are today. And then before that building that is there today, there was a prior building, it was a county home that we moved into in 75. Um, but that's the reason we were out of the airport, because when we acquired, acquired the county patrol, there wasn't enough room here in downtown Clearwater to, um, to have all the cruisers there. So that was the first 10 men of the uniform division that was newly formed. Uh, there was Carl on the front row. Uh, second from the left, and and basically they, the uniforms then looked like what we have now. They were green with gray epaulets, and we've basically gone back to that after our white shirt gray phase. This is the airport office. Um, the first uh, fleet cars, the uniform cars there in the in the front, and the unmarked cars behind that. We had excuse me, we had posse's back during Janung's era, and I'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, Carl's there in the front, cruiser to the right. You can always tell when Carl's in a picture because he stands with his legs apart like that and you can identify him pretty easily. Don Janung was famous for his community relations photographs. And this is probably, this is another eBay picture that I found because I know where it was taken at the Keystone Archery Club. And probably at that time they went out there to try to demonstrate which was faster, the gun or the arrows. You probably know how that turned out. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just a, a fun thing for him to do and, and good publicity for the sheriff's office. Again, when we started, and the county patrol did this as, as well as the sheriff's office, we had cross draw holsters. And back in those days, the cross draws may have seemed a little um, inconvenient, but it was really done for safety because we didn't have, number one, we didn't have cruisers back then. And number two was that if you arrested somebody, they, they were usually in the front seat with you and you didn't have seat belts. So you were kind of at the mercy of them while you were driving and not watching the prisoner. So the, the benefit of the cross draws was because then the gun was next to the car door and not next to the prisoner. So it was a safety issue. And, and basically when we started having cruisers and cages in cars, then we, they moved to the right-hand side. But this was actually done in, in sincerity because they wanted to find out if there was any difference in reaction time, whether it was a cross draw or a side draw holster. Uh, John Cloud, who was our first African-American deputy there on the left, and Carl Peterson, and they went out and demonstrated, and they did find out that the sidearm was faster than the cross draw. So that's when we went to them. You'll see a lot of pictures um, of the sheriff's office deputies with cross draws. So we started out with Stetsons, like there in the middle, and uh, we had a winter Stetson and a summer Stetson. One was out of straw, one was out of wool. And then during the 60s, when there was unrest, not a lot of racial unrest, but a lot of protests going on, 
Uh, Sheriff Tanung wanted to keep his deputies safe, but he also didn't want to wherever the deputies responded to a protest or a, or a riot or an incident, mm -hmm. he didn't want the people to feel bad that the deputies only wore better equipment or different equipment when they, when they were there with them. So for that reason, he, he made us wear the helmets, but he wanted you to wear them all the time. Mm -hmm. So whether you're answering a dog bite call or going to a riot, you, you wore the same, same helmet. And you had to wear them, you got a half an hour to take them off for your dinner break, but you had them, had them on in the car and out of the car. And you got a day off if you didn't, or you caught without your helmet. Fortunately, I missed that era by about three years. Um, so the, basically the only hats we've ever had was the uh, Stetsons, the two versions of that, then we went to the helmets, and then we went to the uh, campaign hats, the green ones we have today. This is a great picture. Um, I wish I'd find this guy. There on the left is a kid named Steve Bannon. That's his mom standing behind him. And up on his other side is um, George Smathers. He was a senator at the time. And Don Janung and John F. John F. Kennedy. And the story behind this picture was that the, little, the boy was a patrol officer, a patrol um, scout for the school crossing guards. It was a crossing guard, basically, in Pinellas Park. And he pushed two little girls out of the way of a speeding car. So he got awarded the medal, the safety medal, and him and his mom and Smathers and Janung went up on the train uh, to Washington, D.C. and received the medal there that President Kennedy is holding. It wasn't a couple, a couple months ago, somebody sent me a whole bunch of other scenes from this event that I didn't know existed. Uh, so I have, I left this one in there, but I have other pictures from that also. This is a picture of um, an incident with, with a motorcade. The men there in the glasses are Secret Service guys. They look like that today. Uh, there was two St. Pete cops, and there was a St. Pete cop there in the middle with a helmet on and two sheriff's office deputies on the sides. The one on the right is G.G. Smith. Uh, he was a ship commander lieutenant when I started. Um, and he, in fact, I was talking to him this week. Uh, he's still around and gave me what happened on this incident. Um, that was a Harley Davidson. It was, a, it, was, it was operated by Officer Ledbetter from St. Pete, St. Pete Police Department. Uh, there was a truck that came out from the side street, hit the motorcycle, led betters laying there on the ground. Uh, he survived, is fine, it was fine. And GZ says he got this, this notion that somebody was getting into his face. And he turned around to say something like, don't, don't get so close to me, and looked right in the face of Richard Nixon. You can see there's in the middle. Uh, Richard Nixon uh, stayed with him to make sure it was okay. And in fact, uh, I gave a speech one time, and one of led betters relatives was there and said not only did he stop the motorcade to, to check on the officer, but he also called Mountain Park Hospital, which is what Bayfront was before it was Bayfront, um, to make sure that uh, he was still okay and, and spoke to him in his hospital room. At one time I was gonna write a book, I'm still considering it, but that was gonna be the cover of the book with Carl. Just a classic picture, you'll see a lot of the executive staff at the sheriff's office now have that picture on their wall, just to be the epitome of what a, a sheriff's office looks like. Uh, Carl and I went out to Crabby Bills one time, and I had that picture in 8x10, because I was going to show him what the book cover was going to look like. And the waiter came by and said, that's a great picture of a cop. And I said, yeah, he's not, that looks like Clint Eastwood. I said, yeah, I can see Clint Eastwood in that. And Carl was probably about 84 at the time, and, and I said, and the, and the man that's in this picture is sitting right here in this booth with me. He goes, no, that's you? And Carl said, yeah. And Carl in his dry humor said, that was taken a few days ago. <laughs> so it was taken a few days ago, but it's still a classic picture and, and one of my favorites. We had posses back then. We had uh, boat posses and mounted posses and volunteer uh, mobile posses. That, that started with the Sheriff Janung and ended with Sheriff Janung. Uh, that was one of the early pictures of the mobile posses. They were all volunteers. If you're a member of the mobile posse, you had to have your own vehicle to get to where you were needed. Uh, same way with the mounted posse, you had to have your own horse and your own trailer. Uh, and a water posse, you had to have your own boat and trailer, uh, all unpaid. That was a great picture of the, uh, the mounted posse. The Sheriff Janung's there in the middle. Carl's there with the American flag and his brother Lester, who again, was an employee, but was a volunteer. He's on the other side. And thankfully for Carl's older brother, Robert, uh, he named all those people in that, all, in that picture for me, and sadly, now that they're all gone. But that's a great picture of the Mountain Posse. That's a picture of Carl, and um, that was probably taken around 120th Avenue and Seminole Boulevard. In fact, you can see Lake Seminole there in the background. Um, and 126th Avenue and Seminole Boulevard, there's a big, there's a mobile home park, and there's a big tree there. 
and Carl remembers climbing that tree when he was a young boy. And that, like I said, that tree's still there. But all the McMullen family and the kids had property there along Lake Seminole from about 126th Avenue South. We also had bloodhounds back in those days. When we had bloodhounds, they weren't like our canine dogs today. They didn't ride around in a car for a shift. They were safe. They were kept out of Carl's ranch. He had a ranch up Whitney Road. And he had horses and dogs and assorted animals out there. So if you needed to have a bloodhound, you had to drive out to Carl's ranch, put one in the cruiser, and drive it to where you needed to go. They were used for parades, but they were also obviously used in publicity. And they were used, actually, back in those days, we had room in Pinellas County to have a horse and dogs looking for somebody, a missing person, escaped prisoner, those kind of things. So they were functional. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. That first, on the left there is Kid, on the right is Spotlight. Uh, Spotlight and his brother, his name is Black Jack, and you'll see a picture of him in a minute. But their canine father was named Bimbo. Bimbo was a tracking dog up at a prison in North Florida. And when the prisoner decided to escape, he took what he thought would be used to find him with him. So if the canine was going to be used, if Bimbo was going to use to find him, he'd just take Bimbo with him when he left without permission, a.k.a. escape. So uh, him and another prisoner took Bimbo and eventually stole a car and drove to Pinellas County. So they got to Pinellas County, they left the stolen car, and they left Bimbo in the car. So the sheriff's office found the car and the dog, and they, whoever found it knew that Carl had bloodhounds already at his ranch. So they called Captain McMullen and said, listen, we have this dog, what do you want us to do with it? And he says, take it out to the ranch, throw it in the pen. So they took the dog out there, took Bimbo out there, and threw it in the pen, and Bimbo fell in love with Maggie, who was a female bloodhound, and they fell in love, and, they, and Maggie gave birth to Bimbo, to, Maggie gave birth to Spotlight and Blackjack as puppies, and Carl and his family trained them to be hunting dogs, uh, tracking dogs, and uh, they grew up with the sheriff's office. Um, they were very popular, everybody loved them. Um, they had to be kept on a lead because they would outrun you. Um, they didn't bite when they found their, their prey. They just bayed, as you'll hear blood bloodhounds do. <coughs> Excuse me. And Carl said they really weren't aggressive whatsoever. The most they could do is lick you to death. Um, but they, would let, they, they were excellent tracking dogs, and a lot of places in North Florida still use bloodhounds. Um, but that's how we came to have bloodhounds, and, and they were very beloved by, by those who worked with them. Uh, this was uh, Spotlight being interviewed by a Clearwater News uh, radio station. And you'll see there it says, uh, Bloodhound knows all, won't tell. Um, <laughs> like I said, he was used for publicity, but he was a functional tracking dog, too. There's Carl and his stepson, Gary Stevenson, there in the article um, when he was interviewed. He was also on the cover of the Florida Magazine. Well, fortunately, for, from Betty Jean's family, had that article and the magazine original uh, for our archives um, and they talked there how the dogs were obtained and, and how they trained them. He was also awarded the Lassie Award. Sometimes I talk to groups that have very young people in them and I'm 62 so you know basically anybody younger than 40 is young but uh, some of those people didn't know who Lassie was but I'm sure this group remembers who Lassie was and he got the award uh, for the uh, from the company. This is a, a demonstration of the tracking dogs. You'll see, if you got real close, you can see Carl up there in a tree and uh, a spotlight and blackjack at the bottom and uh, out there on the Lake Seminole property uh, training them to uh, track. And most all of the McMullen cousins and kids will tell you that they were used as bait <laughs> for the dogs when they were being trained. Um, there's Carl and Blackjack and Spotlight. You can see Blackjack's a little darker than Spotlight was. And this is one of the rare instances of it. We had a picture, another eBay picture, of a dog actually at the scene of a crime. That was the B21 liquor store up in Sarpen Springs. In fact, the liquor store is still there, I understand. Um, you see Spotlight there in the beginning and Gary Stevenson with him. Um, and the story behind this was four guys in that car went to rob the liquor store. They tied up the owner not very well, and they failed to notice on the way out that there was a big uh, carbine gun on top of the door. So when they got in the car, the owner got out of his un very well, very untied well wrap that they tied him up with, got out of that, 
got to the gun above the door and went out and shot that car. Two died at the scene and two ran and they called Spotlight out and he found both of them hiding in the woods. We had football teams for about three years. Um, I can probably tell you from uh, being a lieutenant, they probably stopped because the command staff got tired of Monday morning somebody calling and say, broke my wrist, hurt my knee, my leg hurts. Uh, but at the time, it was a real way for the guys to have camaraderie uh, in that and, and the guys who have, were on the team still uh, have great memories of it. And like I said, it lasted about three years. And they did charity games um, between the Seminole Fire Department and things, and they'd sell tickets and everybody would come out and have a good time. Um, this was a, a picture of a, um, a drug bust where the, uh, the drugs were in the middle of some cedar boards in order for the canine dogs not to find it, but it didn't work. Uh, there on the left is Sheriff Coleman. And third from the left is one of our chief deputies now, George Steffen. That was up in Tarpon Springs. Uh, there's a picture of Everett Rice uh, when he was a detective before he became sheriff. And I put that picture in there just to realize for the younger crowd that TVs used to be that big and had knobs and everything. Mm -hmm. For a while we had top cop races. That's uh, the Mitchell Sheriff uh, Jim Coates. And for some reason, and similar to the football games, uh, these only occurred about every, I think they occurred about three years, but it just wasn't Pinellas County, it was surrounding counties also. We did them out of Sunshine Speedway, um, the sheriffs, the chief deputies, the female deputies, the road, anybody who, who could sponsor a, a car uh, could go out there and, and run races at the speedway. But, you know, the safety harnesses weren't that popular back then. Probably wasn't a good idea to have your command staff out there running a race car. And eventually one of the sheriffs in another county died during these events. So at that time, we kind of put a kibosh on all that, uh, all that events. But for a couple of years, the cop cop races were very popular. And we have a lot of uh, bulletins from there. That's uh, on the far left is uh, our sheriff now, Bob Baltieri. In the middle is uh, our chief deputy now, George Steffen, and uh, with the recovery of narcotics. Uh, when I was in the academy, and when Bev, who was, who's the one there with the alligator, they taught us how to catch alligators. Uh, we only had very few uh, fish and game people working. Uh, Dave Sturman there in that picture there on the, on the uh, right hand side was the only fish and wildlife in Pinellas County. So if he was busy or had something to do, they expected us to take care of the alligator situation. So in the academy, which is where this was, uh, they taught us how to do it safely. I've caught quite a few in my time too. Um, and they don't have any power to open their mouth. They don't have power to shut it. So you can hold their mouth shut with your hands and we duct tape their mouth shut. So that was, I mean, like I said, if you don't, if you don't get between the teeth, you're okay. You can, you can hold their mouth shut with your hand. You want to avoid the tail area, however. And um, in the old days, we just put them in the backseat of our cruiser and, uh, and took them out to the old Wells Brothers garbage place off 49th Street and let them out of our car. That was usually the funniest part, though, because once we got in there, you could handcuff or tie their, their legs up and put the duct tape on. But when you took them out there and let them go, somebody had to let go of a part first. So we'd all get, you know, you take the duct tape off, you take the handcuffs off, and then run like heck. And uh, we take him out there and, and usually jump on top of the car, just waiting for the alligator to decide what he was going to do. And he usually just looked at us and sauntered into the water like it wasn't a big deal to him. Uh, <laughs> there's a picture out of the St. Clara Airport uh, of one of the guys at the time, uh, Tommy Johnson, wrestling an alligator. Uh, another uh, alligator that we we wrangled up. You can see the duct tape on his mouth, and and depending on big they are, when you can handcuff their their legs together or not. I probably can hold a whole demonstration about alligator captures. Um, and and one time, one of the alligators we put in the back seat decided he didn't like the back seat very much, so he came up under the front seat, and the deputy that was driving his car decided to leave the car <laughs> rapidly, and uh, uh, he had to be re, re wrangled again, but. You can imagine having me on the road and looking over and going, oh, <laughs> you're here in the front seat with me. Hello. And this is what probably one of the infamous alligator captures. This was Al, the gator. He was at the Conrad Mobile Home Park in Seminole. He probably weighed uh, about 800 pounds. The Conrad Mobile Home people, and there's Dave Sturman again on the left, um, somebody made a complaint about the alligator. Um, and as most gator nuisance calls evolve, they become nuisances when people feed them. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes they feed them marshmallows. In this case, they were feeding them marshmallows. 
And apparently Al, that has even subsequently named, um, mistook a poodle for a walking marshmallow and ate it. So they decided then that alligator had to go. And so we went out and Sermon was out there and you can see the deputy staying in the background uh, capturing alligator. Uh, fortunately, he did live and he went to live out his life at Bush Gardens. But the owner of Conrad Mobile Home Park was not amused when we took possession of the gator because that was his claim to fame of his park mm. that he had this huge alligator in his lake and people would go out there and feed it and it was a great attraction until it started eating things um, other than marshmallows. So that's, he, was, he was a nuisance gator for that but it, back in those days the nuisance gators used to be taken somewhere to live out their life rather than destroyed like they are today these days. Excuse me, these days. So alligator had to go. Um, they all got him captured, but you know when you, when you need a pickup truck or a wrecker to pick up the alligator, um, he was very heavy. So he did get lifted by the tow truck and put in the back of a pickup truck, which I think I have a picture of, yeah. He put in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, there's Mr. Conrad there to the left. You can see his, his uh, dismay that his uh, attraction was being taken away. Um, but it was, it was a, you can see how big that, that alligator was. Uh, back in those days, again, not only was it popular to dress up your children as deputies, it was <laughs> popular to dress up your gorillas. Um, that was at the gorilla farm up in Tarpon Springs. Um, that was uh, Clyde Lanier was in that picture of that old Mobile 88. Uh, they had to call him because he was the biggest deputy we had with the biggest shirt to fit the gorilla. And uh, in fact, with a connection, the guy there who ran the gorilla farm, his great granddaughter runs the uh, Fun Center in Seminole now. So I took this picture out to her so she could have it. But we have a couple pictures of the, of like that with Mike Coachman, um, Solomon Coachman, that was in our first picture from 1912. That's his grandson there with the gorilla sitting on his knee. Uh, we have two pictures of, of Mike Coachman there and G.G. Smith with the gorilla and they were kind of wary about his hands on their knee. Um, and you can see the, the, the guy in the back I think, I think the gorilla farm actually is still there yeah. after all this time. And this is the last segment that I have. Um, this is, goes back to Dora. Um, when I got with her on the phone and on the computer, um, that's Dora's dad. Oh, wow. That's Leonard Henry, H-E-N-D-R-Y. And like I said, Carla told me that one of the first deputies was Leonard Henry, H-E-N-R-Y. But when I talked to Dora, um, she said no, her dad's name was Leonard Henry, H-E-N-D-R-Y. And she sent me those two pictures. That was that was him and her mother, and the picture of him. Um, and Marvel Whitehurst, our first sheriff, came from Palm Harbor area, mm -hmm. and that's where they lived. And it was very popular back then, and, and made sense that Marvel Whitehurst would ask one of his neighbors to be one of his deputies, mm -hmm. um, because cars weren't that prevalent back in those days. And you you had a neighborhood, and usually all of the neighborhood had 12 or 13 kids per family. And you just grew up with your neighbors because you didn't have a car to go anywhere else. Um, so it made sense that Marvel Whitehurst grew up in the same neighborhood, excuse me, as the Henry family. And he asked uh, Leonard to be one of his first deputies. So uh, she sent me those pictures and I went out to our archives and found out where her dad there in our archive book, it says Ellen Henry arrested somebody on January 17th of 1912, which was 17 days after the county was formed. So I sent that to Dora and she was very happy and, and Dora and I keep in touch and I read her articles that she does. Uh, she's a great storyteller and I hope to meet her in person one day. Um, but that was a great piece of history coming back through the power of technology. That was our first jail uh, and it, it, wasn't, it, it lasted probably about five or six years until the one down the street was built and I think I have a picture of that next. Um, and again that building is still there. It's used as an office building now. Um, and one of our, our first academy classes, they took pictures on the steps of that courthouse. And that's where the sheriff's office and the office of the sheriff were before we moved out to the airport. You can see a rec yard there on the top. And in 1980, we had a jail riot there, which I was invited to and attended. Um, one of our local attorneys, who ironically was the attorney we had teaching us law in the academy, Josie Arcelino, uh, he went there to, uh, visited an inmate and it, the inmates took him hostage mm -hmm. and threatened to cut off a finger for every demand that wasn't met. Uh, we went and rescued uh, Josie Arcelino and he had all 10 of his fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, so that didn't work out too well for the inmates and uh, we've never had one since. So 
we were told the next day that was probably the only incident we'd ever see of that occurring, and he was right. That was the only incident we ever had. That's um, Forrest Peacock. He was our first uh, ID man. Before that, if you had, if you wanted anything processed at a scene, you had to have your own fingerprint powder or get some from the agency and your own camera to photograph anybody. But when Forrest Peacock came along, uh, there in the middle, uh, they were real happy to see him, so they didn't have to do that anymore. Because if, if any of you have been in my fingerprint powder, it's pretty messy. So they were glad they didn't have to do that anymore. And that's Don Janone on the left. And that was our first academy class. Uh, there on those, those uh, courthouse steps, like I said. Uh, there's Don Janung there in the middle. And uh, Bill Roberts on the other side, and Carl there in the front is the captain, and the rest of those are our first academy class. There's three, three of those men that are still with us. Our first helicopter arriving to the St. Pete Corridor Airport. As I said before, George McNally, uh, who was with that uh, colored county patrol car, he was our first helicopter pilot. Don Janone was famous for going away to conferences and he'd come back and go, this is a great idea, let's do this. He was very progressive and he went out to some conference in California and came back and says, we need a helicopter. So they got with the, uh, the military surplus and got us a helicopter and uh, it became very functional. But I have articles now that, that say how wary the county was that a helicopter would be out there spying on people <laughs> and that, you know, all those things that, that doesn't seem like that long ago, but back then helicopters were a new thing and uh, felt that their privacy would be invaded if they had a helicopter in the sky. Our first computers, we were a very progressive agency. We still are to this day. Uh, in, the, in 76, 75, 76, we got our first in-car computers. That was the first computer that I worked on in the cars. They have laptops there now. I can remember uh, people leaning in to my cruiser window when that was <laughs> an okay thing to do. Uh, and they were amazed that we, could, we got our calls through this computer and we talked car to car on the computer and we talked to the dispatcher on the computer. We could run wants and warrants on the computer. Uh, we could do everything on it that you can do now basically on your cell phone. But people, the public back then was just amazed that we had this technology in our car. Wow. We're, and now, looking back, we can do all that on our cell phone. <laughs> but uh, back then, in the, even in the early 70s, it was a remarkable thing. We were one of two agencies in Florida had that system. Um, probably one, less than 10 in the United States had a system at the time, so we were very progressive. There on the left is Connie Johnson. She's our first female deputy. She was hired as an auto theft investigator because back then females weren't allowed to be road deputies. Connie was a circus showgirl in a, in a uh, show, and she was a bartender in her past life. And she came over and wanted to be a cop, and Don Janung thought it was too dangerous for women to be on the road. So they hired her as an auto theft investigator. And one time when she was on her way to work, she arrested the DUI, and uh, he was very uncooperative. And she basically pulled him out through the window without opening the door. And uh, Don Janung thought that if she could handle the drunk, she could probably handle herself. Uh, she threatened to go over to Hillsborough County where they were hiring uh, female deputies. And so based on that, and, and Janung's logic was, well, so if you've been a bartender, you know how people talk, so you can probably handle that part of the job, so he hired her to be the first female deputy. Um, we have a display at the sheriff's office at Park and, uh, at Umberton and Seminole Boulevard. There's a display in the lobby that anybody can go see. Um, and I have a display up at the North District Station, which is the Curlew and uh, A19. And there's also a display we have now at Heritage Village in the Low House. And there's a picture of Connie there. Uh, it took me a long time to trace her down, and she was already a hero of mine because she came a few years before I did, so I never got to meet her when she worked there. She left us and uh, became a Minnesota State Trooper, and then went on to be uh, MPs in the Army. And, <coughs> excuse me, like I said, people always compared the girls that came after her to, to the men of first. So when I finally found her a couple years ago, I was, I was thrilled to find her and, and be in contact, contact with her to this day. The one on the other side, and Carl's famous words were, it was taken a few years ago. That was me when I was 21 years old, uh, 41 years ago, working on that ancient first computer there. Um, it was a great career, and I had, I had a great time doing it, and I even have a better time now teaching the history of the Sheriff's Office to people. But like I said, in Carl's words, uh, that wasn't taken yesterday. Our first African-American deputy, John Cloud, I interviewed him, he's passed away now, but I've interviewed him numerous times. 
Unfortunately, Sheriff Galtieri was brought him into the sheriff's office before he passed away and, and gave him an honor of, of being recognized as the first African American deputy in 1962. Um, I can tell you for a fact that being a female in the 70s uh, in that office and in the public was not easy. But I can guarantee you for 62 for an African American man to be a deputy sheriff, uh, he was given a hard time on a lot of areas. So we appreciate him. He was the kindest, gentlest man you'd ever want to meet. Uh, one of our, that's uh, Spotlight, getting an award for being the first sergeant canine with Carl and Janelle. Our first female canine, that's Joan Half. Uh, she was our first canine deputy with her dog. Um, I saw her last year. Uh, she comes into town once in a while. And uh, she's still a canine deputy for the University of Missouri. She has bomb dogs now. And our first dive team. You see here, it says Sheriff's Department on the thing, so you can kind of give an estimate of what year that was. Our first gym, well, we've come a long way since then, but it probably wasn't until the, the 90s when we started having a gym there uh, for us to take a, take a, <coughs> a physical fitness was an important part of our, our training. Uh, this is the last couple slides here are the uh, lobby displays we have in the sheriff's office. And if you go in there, like I said, you can go in there and look. And um, it shows the first sets and health. A lot of the things that we know that I talked about today are pictures that you've seen today. Uh, but there's the sets and hats up there, the winter version and the summer version. And our long sleeve uh, white shirts. The other shirt was a, um, the other jacket actually, was a um, jacket of a mobile posse member. If you look on the bottom of it, there's little hooks, and hooks would go on your gun belt, so when you got out of your car, your jacket wouldn't ride up uh, and be uncomfortable. And there on the left-hand side is our campaign hats. Um, our helmets we have there, the bubble lights that we had in that cruiser, um, and that the radio on your left, second down, that fed on Sheriff Janung's for many, many years. It shows there our ledger books where I found Leonard Henry's number. And some of our badges are in there too. And that's the last slide.